Weak Boy becomes the strongest demon hunter after losing his dad. The story begins with two brothers, Zen and Sheng, who are hiding and running away as everything around them crumbles, while their daddy, Yuan, fights against a demon. The martial artist finds it tough to match the strength of the big red demon with two chain balls. He gets hit into a stone pillar by the demon, and Zen comes there to help his dad out. The demon tries attacking him and the Dilf has to save his son's pathetic ass. He hits the demon in the head to give it a concussion, and then yeets his sons to a high ground using his staff. The demon attacks him and presses him down, but Yuan's weapon turns out to be an oversized nunchuck, which he uses to tie the demon's hand and pull it towards him. He then leaps at him and then lands a powerful kick to the demon's face before trying to strangle it. The demon is too strong and not even the Dilf can choke him. He breaks the chains and sends Yuan flying away, but he simply kicks the broken pieces of his weapon to the demon and uses a powerful sealing spell to bind them. The demon resists, but Yuan doesn't give it a chance and traps it using the stone pillars nearby. Yuan jumps to Zen, telling him that the prison won't hold the demon for long, and they start running to safety. They reach an abandoned temple within an ancient forest. Yuan does some gang signs and disperses the overgrown vines from the area to reveal two swords embedded in an altar. As soon as Yuan and Zen hold one sword each, the sword starts to glow. They draw the swords and release the energy stored within the altar and bring out the secret treasure of their family. Yuan takes the small box and entrusts it to Zen, telling him to give it to Sheng when he comes of age. He gives both the swords to Zen, telling him that they are the twin swords belonging to the greatest demon hunter. Suddenly, the ground starts shaking and Yuan realizes that the demon has freed itself from the prison. He leads his son through a magical cave and reaches a platform situated over a volcano. Suddenly, the red demon breaks in through the roof and presses Yuan to the ground. Yuan uses his spiritual magic and hits the demon with the floating LED blocks. As soon as he is free from the demon's grasp, he uses a powerful spell and seals the demon inside a ball made of the magical LED blocks. The ball breaks the bridge and falls into the lava below, but Yuan is still safe. Then suddenly, a hand pierces his chest and gives all Demon Slayer fans PTSD. Yuan knows the pale-skinned demon who just pierced his heart and asks him how she can enter this sacred area. The woman shows him a magical bell, saying that she was hiding inside the temple forever. Yuan falls to his knees and uses his final breath to send his crying sons to safety with a teleportation spell. The female demon tries to stop them from leaving, but all she manages to do is leave a scar on Zen's face before he is sent to another part of the world. Many years have passed since then, and Zen has become a fully grown adult who works as a demon hunter, while Sheng is now 14. Today is Sheng's coming of age ceremony, and Zen throws some gold dust at him while chanting a prayer. The talismans placed in the room surround Sheng along with the gold dust, and they disappear after awakening his talent. He doesn't feel so different, but Zen tells him to believe in himself. He then gives Sheng the gift their dad left him before dying. Sheng eagerly opens the box to find a small iron rod and wonders if it used to clean earwax or something. Zen tells his brother that their dad said it was his destiny, so he happily wears it as a necklace. Just then, an old man comes running to them requesting help because his village is under attack by demons. Zen refuses to take the mission because Sheng's coming of age ceremony is not over yet. He tells his brother that he has made arrangements for him to become a man tonight and takes him away. He shoves the old man aside and a bell drops from the purse. Hearing its sound once is enough to tell Zen that it is the bell belonging to the demon who killed his dad. He is overcome with emotions and immediately takes out the old NPC's quest. The two brothers enter an area covered in thick fog and get separated. A cat demon with the powers of invisibility comes to greet Zen and he asks her about the bell. The cat demon launches air slashes at him and Zen can only dodge her attacks before one attack hits his back. Zen unleashes his full power spins like a tornado, knocking down the cat girl instantly. She instantly surrenders and acts like a thought, offering her body in exchange for her life. Zen has no interest in furries and since the cat demon can't even tell him about the bell, he just asks her to leave the village. However, just as he turns around, the cat demon tries to take him by surprise. Zen had anticipated that and he uses a special move to slash her behind his back, turning her into dust. As the cat girl vanishes, she tells Zen that her brother will kill his brother to make it Egan. He is worried about Sheng and goes looking for him, only to find him facing the cat girl's elder brother. Sheng uses a wooden stick to show off his kung fu moves and pushes the cat boy back, but that enrages him and he increases his speed to attack him recklessly. He deals severe damage to Sheng and even destroys his stick. Just as Sheng falls, he notices his tiny iron rod glowing, and as soon as he grabs it, it grows manifold. Sheng throws his enlarged rod at the cat demon, and the energy wave released because of it is felt throughout the six realms. 
Zen can only stare and wonder at his unconscious brother and the golden staff that is still embedded in the cat boy's chest. The cat boy tries to take out the staff, but Zen arrives there just then to ask him about the bell. The bell sound hypnotizes cat boy, and he says that the demon named Sumire gave it to him. Zen realizes that the bell is forcing the demon to speak the truth, and he asks Zen more about the demon Sumire. However, he has a broken record now and keeps on saying that he will kill the demon hunter and steal the soul fragment. The bell then suddenly goes out of control and escapes Zen's hand to enter the cat boy's body. He increases in size and quickly becomes like an average American before self-destructing with a huge explosion. Zen rushes to his brother and shields him from the explosion, and soon after that, Shang wakes up. The brothers pick up their weapons, and Shang's staff shrinks in small size just after one pump. He runs to Zen and asks how to make it bigger again, and he suggests putting it in his mouth. Suddenly, someone tells them to hand the staff to them. Zen looks up to see a girl wearing a Peppa Pig mask and a purple-haired boy next to her. He wants to fight them, but the explosion from earlier has damaged his body a lot. Shang tries to talk peacefully with the two strangers, but peace was never an option for them. Peppa Pig asks him to hand over the staff, and Zen tells her that she will have to fight him for that. He charges at the girl, only to get slapped by her. She charges her spiritual cannon to blast him off, but the purple-haired guy with her stops both sides from fighting. He uses his magic iPad to cast a healing spell to fix Zen's injuries, and then introduces himself as Sorrow and the pig girl as Sheba, who turns out to be quite cute underneath the mask. After that, Saro says that they are from the God Clan, and they are here for the divine weapon Shang possesses. They say that it is the divine staff belonging to the God of War. He explains how the God of War was killed in the war between gods and demons, and his body shattered into 72 parts, and the staff is the key to finding them. Saro claims that they want to gather all the 72 fragments, reawaken the god of war, and then free all gods from the dimension they are sealed in. Zen thinks that this must be the soul fragment the cat demon was talking about earlier, so he refuses to hand over the staff to Saro. However, Saro tells him that the energy of the divine staff can be felt throughout the six realms, and even demons must have felt it. Currently, the demon lore is also sealed in a separate dimension along with the gods, and his underlings will definitely try to get their hands on the divine staff to free him. Sheepa says that if they free the gods first, the world will be saved, but if the demons succeed in freeing their ruler first, everything will be doomed. While Zen is still uncertain about trusting them, Shang decides to give the divine staff to the god clan for the sake of the world. Shang gives the staff to Sheba, but it immediately turns into an ordinary iron rod in her hands. She calls it a fake, but as soon as Shang takes it back, it turns golden once again. Sheba can't believe it, and Zen mocks her, saying that the divine staff doesn't like her nasty personality. Even Sorrow agrees, saying that only a pure soul can awaken the divine staff, and only Shang fits the bill. Sheba is desperate to get the staff, so she asks Shang to come along with her, and Zen decides to take up this chance. They go to the gate of the village, and Shang uses the divine staff as a compass that points towards the nearest fragment of the god of war. As soon as they find the direction, Sorrow shows off his generational wealth and summons his version of the Batmobile. They travel through a desert, and Shang and Zen stuff themselves with some juicy meat, and Sheba is disgusted. While they are bickering, a tired woman suddenly comes in the way of their Batmobile, causing it to engage the safety protocols and jump over her. Zen goes outside to check what happened, and as soon as he sees a thick mummy outside, he immediately rushes to her aid. He finds that the girl is injured, and the simp inside him forces her to take her into the car. Shiba refuses to allow any unverified person into her car, but Zen says that she is just jealous because this girl has more curves than her. He takes the girl inside anyway, and after receiving treatment, she introduces herself as Zayang. She says that she ran into some bandits yesterday and got injured while trying to escape them. Zen is furious and decides to teach the bandits a lesson, and Zayang tells him that they are in the Dark Canyon. Coincidentally, that is the location of the soul fragment they are looking for. The two brothers are total simps for the thickness of Zayang, and they do not hesitate in showing the divine staff to her and telling her about the god of war. Sheba freaks out at their irresponsible behavior, and it seems that Zayang has some hidden motives as well. Starvo seems to notice it, and he tells Zayang that they will rest tonight and head to the dark canyon in the morning. At night, the brothers and Zayang share the same room. She pretends to be asleep and wakes up once she is certain that everyone else is in deep sleep. Zayang uses her ring, which has Spider-Man's powers trapped inside it, to steal the divine staff from Sheng, but he swats her web away. She is about to try again, but then Sargo accidentally enters their room after taking a midnight shower, foiling her plans. The next morning, Zen is stunned when he learns that Zayang is missing, and he immediately wants to escort her to fight the bandits. He asks Sheng to follow him, but he breaks down when he realizes that the divine staff is also missing. 
Shiba gets a panic attack on hearing this, but Suro's calm because he anticipated this. He patiently drives the Batmobile deep into the canyon, and stops in front of the cave, telling everyone that they will find the woman and the divine staff here because he put a tracker on them. Right now, Zayang is inside the cave with the leader of the bandits, who has her little sister Zian tied up in some kinky rope play. He had asked Zayang to steal the divine staff for him in exchange for her sister's freedom, and she tosses him the divine staff and receives her sister's freedom in exchange. Zayn cries and apologizes to her sister because Zayang had sworn never to steal again, and now she will lose her powers after committing the sin of stealing. Zayang says that it doesn't matter, and the two sisters start leaving the cave. However, the leader of the bandits has other plans. He sends his assistant, who is just Voldemort with a nose and hair, to stop the girls and then approaches Zayang, asking for her night rate. She is furious and slaps his hand away before using her spider woman powers on him. The bandit dodges the web, but Zayang can control it freely and turns it around to tie his legs. The bandit boss falls down and Zayang snatches the divine staff from him. The assistant knows he tries to attack her, but she bluffs him by pointing the staff at him and then shoots a web at his face. She picks up her sister, and they start running towards the exit, but Zayang trips, and the bandits catch up to them. Zayang shoots a web at them, but the boss cuts it, and then attacks her. She manages to push Zian away, but Nozi appears behind her to attack her. Zayang dodges the bandit boss and shoots Nozi with a powerful web shot. The boss attacks her again and she leaps in the air and shoots more webs at him. He uses his earthbending skills to hit her with a rock pillar, knocking her down. Zayang wants her sister to escape, but then Nozi frees himself from her web and uses his spiritual power to trap them both in a barrier. On the other hand, Zen and others are looking for them. They split up into two teams and the brothers run headfirst into the complex cave network. They soon reach the place where Zayang and her sister are trapped, thanks to Zen's nose, which can smell women from miles away. Zion tries to negotiate with the bandit boss to let her sister go in exchange for her, and he accepts. Nozi removes the barrier and the boss tries to feel up Zian's plot, but Zion attacks him without a warning, cutting his face. The boss is furious, and he uses his earthbending powers to attack Zion again, but Zion comes between them and shields her sister from that attack. She pathetically dies from that single attack and Zion cannot stop crying. Zen is furious as he sees this, and he lunges at the bandit boss, who summons his sword and blocks his attack. Zen stands in front of Zion while Shang tries to attack Nozi but misses. Just then, the wall next to them is blown away, and Shiba arrives there with sorrow. She tells Zion to return the divine staff and attacks her with her spirit cannon, but Zen defends her and deflects the attack towards the roof. Shiba lashes out at him, asking if the bitch seduced him again. But this time, even Shang takes Zion's side and explains her story to Shiba. Meanwhile, Saro has noticed that the signal of the God of War's soul fragment is coming from the bandit boss. Shiba wants to attack him immediately, but Zem is still standing in her way. He tells Shang to take Zion to safety and stops Nozi from trying to interfere. The bandit boss just laughs, summons his entire crew there and commands them to attack the intruders. Shiba turns to Saro and he uses tornado magic to immediately suck all the weaklings and toss them out of the hole in the roof. The bandit boss tries to attack Shang and Zion next, but Saro uses his wind magic to save them. However, the boss is relentless and attacks them again, but this time Zen blocks his attack. Nosi throws daggers at him, but Shiba blocks them and then attacks the boss, pushing him back. Saro uses his magic iPad and throws a thunderbolt at the sky, creating thunderclouds outside. The boss asks Nosi to create his barrier, but Shiba hits him into oblivion like Teen Rocket, just before Saro Pikachu's the shit out of his boss. Saro then tells Zen to take the girls and run. He picks up Zian while Shang supports Zion, who apologizes and returns the Divine Staff to him. Meanwhile, the bandit boss attacks Saro, who dodges his heavy blow and counters with a fire spell. The boss uses a rock shield to make his attack backfire on him, pun intended. He decides to finish off Saro with another attack, but Shiba fends him off. The bandit boss then manipulates many rocks at once and shoots them towards Shiba and Saro, but Saro uses a water spell to block them. The water curtain is not strong enough to stop the attacks, and they jump out of the way, after which Shiba fires her spirit cannon at the bandit boss. He throws a rock to stop the attack from reaching him, but the attack separates into smaller beams that hit him. The boss still manages to defend himself using his earthbending powers. He laughs that he is invincible while standing in a pool of water, and Shiba realizes that he never went to the science class. Saro sends a thunderbolt at the boss and gets Pikachu'd again, and then Shiba finishes him off with a full power spirit cannon. The soul fragment reaches towards her, and she decides to retreat immediately. Meanwhile, Zen and Shang have safely brought out the two thick sisters outside, when suddenly, Nosi attacks them. 
Shang is quick to notice and tackles him mid-air, but he takes more damage from that than Nozi. Zen steps up to defend his brother and attacks Nozi, who pushes him back. He uses two daggers as well as six extra arms made from wind magic to keep pressing Zen to a corner and deals some light injuries to him. Zen can only dodge Nozi's wind arms and he soon starts feeling dizzy because of the blood loss. Shen grabs Nozi to give his brother a chance to recover, but Nozi constantly hits him and stops Zen from helping by trapping him in a barrier. He then kicks Shang to Zen, who can only slash at the barrier in vain. Zion tries to attack him from behind, but he is ready for her and blocks her attack. He turns to Zen and uses petrification magic to turn his hands and feet into stones. The petrification begins to spread all over his body, and Zen tells Shang to take the girls and run away. He refuses to do so and keeps punching the barrier until his hands bleed. Nozi gets bored of him and tosses him away. As Shang lies on the ground, he wishes for strength to be a demon hunter like his brother. He cries at his weakness, but then suddenly the divine staff starts glowing too brightly. As soon as Shang grabs it, the light grows even brighter, and the divine staff grows to its normal size. Shang hits the barrier, covering his brother with that, shattering it and reducing the spread of the petrification. He is knocked back while doing that, and Nozi kicks him away. He takes the divine staff, which turns into the small rod in his hands. Zen goes to Shang just as he loses consciousness, and this enrages him enough to break free of the petrification. As Nozi is trying to grow the divine staff bigger, Zen suddenly chops his hand off. He rushes towards Nozi, blocking all his attacks, and then hits him with a powerful air slash to finally defeat him. Nozi is on the ground, but he is still confident that he will live because, as a demon hunter, Zen cannot kill humans. He laughs, saying that he reminds him of another demon hunter whom he fought 12 years ago in the orders of a certain woman. Zen thinks it might be a clue to his father's killer, and asks Nozi about that woman, but before he can say anything, he starts hearing the sound of the bell and hits his expiration date rather abruptly. Another soul fragment leaves his body and Zen realizes there's nothing he can do now. At night, everyone is inside the Batmobile and Sero tries to heal Zian, but his magic is not strong enough to cure her fatal injuries. Zion cries for her sister, so Sara tells her that there is a way to save her. He suggests that they can save Zian's spirit to the cloud, and then get it healed from a spiritual master. However, Zian's physical body will be destroyed in doing that, and she will have to be revived by downloading her soul and installing it in a corpse. Zion accepts that way of preserving her sister, and Sara seals Zian's spirit in her ring. Shang took a great deal of emotional damage upon seeing this, so he is out in the open, whining and about his weakness. Zen arrives to console him and tells him that, since the Divine Staff chose him, he has unknown potential. He asks him to believe in himself and hands him the Divine Staff. They return to the Batmobile, and the Divine Staff absorbs the God of War's soul fragments. They decide to set out on their journey again, but Zion pleads with them to let her join the crew. She promises to be of help, and Zen is immediately sold. Shiba still doesn't like her. But since Saro gives his permission, Zion becomes a member of the team. Soon, they reach an industrial city filled with Chinese sweatshops, and Sheng's body immediately reacts to the environment, making him sick. Saro argues that it is because of the two souls absorbed by his divine staff that he will feel better with time. However, they will go to the shop of an earth god and take medicine to help him with that. The temperature of the city in Fahrenheit is higher than my IQ, and Zhang changes into her thought uniform, and Shiba gets jealous of her big assets. They go to a shop and Zen is shocked because it looks like Victoria's secret store and not a medicine store, but Saro asks him to trust him. They enter the shop and a beaver-like shopkeeper comes out to greet them. He tries to sell some swimsuits to the girls, so Shiba bashes his face in with a solid punch. The beaver gives up on making his sales and then pushes a secret button to bring out the real goods he sells. Shiba immediately asks him for senju beans that heal all injuries and Dragon Ball fans will know what I'm talking about. The beaver shopkeeper gives her one bean, and she immediately shoves it in Shang's mouth to make him feel better. Zen wants to buy as many senju beans as he can, but just one bean costs more than a luxury apartment in New York. He is devastated, but Saro has a 15-figure bank balance, and he buys it for Zen. After that, Shiba asks the beaver why the city is so hot, and he replies that 100 years ago, during the war between demons and gods, a giant flaming meteor fell into the city, and it has been heating the entire city ever since then. The beaver says that the mayor of this city is a demon who is using the energy from the meteorite to rule over everyone. The beaver is a god himself, but he cannot dare to oppose the demon mayor because he is greatly proficient in fire magic. This gives Sarva some ideas and he asks Shang to take out the divine staff and swing it around. He does as he is told and the staff releases energy waves that resonate with the meteorite. Sarva's guess is proven right and he claims that another fragment of the god's soul is near the meteorite. 
Zen Shiba and Saru decide to team up to face the high-ranking demon mayor, and they leave Shang in Zhang's care. He is still not feeling well and takes a small nap. Shang then sees a dream of the war between the demons and gods. The god of war shows great valor and defeats the demons easily, and then he enlarges his staff to legendary proportions, wiping out a great chunk of the demon army in one go. However, the demon lord attacks him from behind and he falls to the ground with a hole in his heart. He disintegrates into 72 fragments and two of them take the form of the souls Zen got from the bandit boss and Nozi. Sheng reaches out to them, and the bandit boss and Nozi appear before him. They try to tempt him into sacrificing his soul in exchange for great power. They call him a weakling who is useless without his brother and tell him that if he sacrifices his soul, he can gain the full power of the divine staff. Sheng refuses to be tempted by this offer, and suddenly the images of the two scoundrels vanish. A golden light shines from his chest, and he finds the giant form of the divine staff breaking through the dimensions. Sheng hears the voice of the god of war, who tells him that he passed the test, and from today on, he will take care of making him stronger. Sheng wakes up to the sight of Zion wiping off his sweat, and he feels his personal divine staff enlarging. The real divine staff falls from his pocket after its string breaks, so Zion picks it up and takes it to the beaver shopkeeper. She soon returns with a new and super strong string around it, so that it doesn't break easily. On the other hand, Zen's team reaches the furnace that has been built around the meteorite, and Saro scans it to find that the demon mayor is on the top floor and the building's full of demons. Saro wants to find a way to sneak in, but Zen wants to do it the hard way. He cuts into the building wall, and a huge army of armed bodyguards arrives there. They are all small fries, and they get their asses whooped pretty quickly. Zen and others enter the main hall after that and find that all the portraits there show a pretty redhead. Suddenly, the demon mayor arrives there saying that he had been waiting for guests like them to come here. Zen doesn't wait for him to finish his monologue and attacks him, but the mayor forces him to back off using a fire tornado. He tells Zen that he doesn't want to do anything with him because he is more interested in fighting the two gods with him. The mayor walks down the stairs, covering himself in flames. He tells Shiba that if she wants the soul fragment within his body, she must defeat him. Zen attacks him first, but the mayor's flame takes the form of a barrier and blocks his attack. The mayor sends him flying with a fire attack, but Zen's sword can block his fire. He attacks Zen again and sends him away, but Saro stops him from falling using his wind magic. Saro tells the mayor that the meteorite still has a lot of energy, and it is reacting to the spirit fragment he has inside his body. He asks the mayor to give up the spirit fragment to save the city from turning into a volcano, but he just laughs it off. He declares that instead of calming the meteorite, he has other uses for it. The mayor has some history with the god clan, and he plans to destroy their world using the meteor. Shiba attacks him as soon as he hears this, but the mayor blocks it with a barrier and then sends a flame whip towards her. She tries to dodge it, but the whip follows her and grips her spiritual cannon, quickly overheating it. Shiba asks Saro to cool it down and uses water magic for that, but it is useless before the mayor's flame. Shiba's spirit cannon is destroyed, and the mayor complains that he wanted to make her bleed. Sheng suddenly gets to his feet and tells Shiba and Zen to run away, because if the mayor gets their blood, it will be trouble. He volunteers to stall the mayor and blocks his fire attacks with the twin swords as he orders Shiba and Zen to run away. The mayor keeps attacking him with his fireballs, and Zen tries to overwhelm him with his great speed. He throws a sword at the mayor and then quickly appears behind him to slash him, but all he cut was an illusion. The real mayor is on the floor and he grabs Zen's leg with a flame whip and slams him into a wall. He picks up his swords and rushes at the mayor again, but gets knocked out with just one punch instead. The mayor decides to cut costs and cremate Zen right away, but then Shiba and Saro arrive there to save him. Saro uses an ice wall to block the fire attack, but he suffers a minor cut in the neck. The two gods escape with Zen, but a few drops of Saro's blood are on the ground, which is all that the mayor wants. He creates a magic circle before the portrait of the redhead, and suddenly, the furnaces all over the city get activated. The flaming meteorite also rises up in the air, and the mayor laughs as he uses his firepower to send it beyond the clouds. Shiba panics because the mayor is trying to destroy their god realm using the meteorite, but Saro thinks that it won't be possible. He is right, but that is not good news for the city, as the meteorite breaks into hundreds of small, burning parts that rain over the city. They run towards the beaver's shop, hoping that he has a solution for this problem. Meanwhile, the entire city is in chaos because of the meteorite shower, and Shang is worried about his brother. Zhang tells him that they will be fine and takes him to safety, but Shang hears a girl crying, so he runs to save her. Suddenly, the debris from a broken building falls on top of them, but Zhang saves them using her Spider Woman powers. Moments later, Shiba's group also arrives there and everyone hurries towards the emergency shelter. 
Zen is badly injured after his fight with the mayor and even the senju beans are not healing him immediately. The shelter also doesn't seem to be safe as it keeps on shaking because of the damage and Sura wonders how they can stop the demon mayor. Shiba asks how he could control the power of the meteorite for so long, and the beaver has an answer for that. He says that there is a cryonic core deep within the heart of the city, which was used to control a large amount of power in the city's glory days. However, it is heavily guarded and trying to take it by force won't work. The only way is to steal it, and Zayang asks everyone if they want her to do the dirty deed. Shag knows that if she breaks her vow to never steal again, she will suffer great punishment, so he is against that. However, the beaver says that the cryonic core was originally a property of the god clan, and they are just taking it back, so technically, it is not stealing. So Zion crawls into the underground area and finds two security guards busy watching their favorite only fans model. She uses her web slinging powers to take them both down quickly. Zion notices that the model they were watching is the mayor's secretary, so she launches a surprise attack on her. She pins her to the wall and asks about the cryonic core. The secretary acts timid to distract her, and then attacks Zayang with her martial arts skills. Zayang is more agile than her, so she quickly dodges her attacks and then staples her to the wall with her web. She asks the secretary about the cryonic core again, and when she refuses, she decides to show her why all girls fear the tentacle monster. The secretary can't resist the web of pleasure and ends up telling Zayang the location and the passcode to the core. Zayang reaches the cryonic core but steps on a trap, then a giant mechanical spider drops from the roof to face her. On the other hand, the shelter starts to crumble under the mayor's ruthless attack. Shiba realizes that they cannot wait for Zion to return with the core because by the time she returns, everyone in the shelter will die. So she summons her spiritual cannon again and decides to face the crazy demon mayor and Soro decides to follow her. Outside, the demon mayor walks in the ruins of the city he used to rule. As he sees the death and destruction, he recalls the memories he had with his wife. They were happy in their married lives when the war between the gods and demons started. The mayor's wife was worried that their city would be caught in the crossfire, but he assured her that this is neutral territory and they have a good relationship with the gods, so they would protect him. However, the burning meteorite hit his home when he was out to work, and as a result, his wife died. As he saw her dead body, he snapped, and then the soul fragment of the god of war found him and granted him immense power. Now the mayor just wants revenge, and he won't stop at anything. Suddenly, he feels an attack coming from behind and blocks it. He turns around to find Shiba and Saro there, so he attacks them, but Saro counters it using his ice magic. Shiba keeps launching cannon shots at the mayor while asking him why he hates the god clan so much. He dodges her attacks and then tells her that they were the ones who took everything away from him, and he will destroy them too. He launches a powerful flame at them and Saro tries to block it with an ice wall, but it melts almost instantly. As they are about to be engulfed by flames, the divine staff comes flying there and dispels all the fire. Soon, Sheng comes there, running to back them up. The mayor comes to the ground and Sheng asks him to stop his madness because it is hurting his own people. The mayor starts crying, saying that he was betrayed by the god clan and lost the love of his life because of that. He unleashes his flames as he declares that he will get revenge at all costs. Sheng still can't understand it, so the mayor dumbs it down for him. He says that the meteorite that destroyed the city and killed his wife was sent by the god clan. Sheng is stunned to hear this and turns to sorrow for clarification. He says that the demon lord tried attacking the city of gods with a giant meteorite, so they used a barrier to deflect it towards the human realm. Sheng is a cast to learn this and Saro can only apologize to the mayor for his loss, but he doesn't accept it. He attacks Shiba with a fireball, but Sheng quickly creates a barrier to keep her safe. The mayor walks up to him and tells him that he is on the wrong side. Sheng simply gets up and hits him with the good old heavy morality. He says that if he destroys this city for vengeance, he will become a monster worse than the gods who destroyed his life, and no matter what he does, he cannot change the past. He tells the mayor to use his power to make the city a better place, but he is not having any of that crap. He transforms into his true demonic self and sends Sheng flying with a single punch. On the other hand, Zayang has defeated the giant robot spider. She goes to the cryonic core and tries to bind it with her web, but the core instantly freezes the web. Its barrier releases an energy wave, and Zion doesn't know what to do next as she sucks at handling technology being a woman. Back at the battlefield, Shang used a barrier to save himself at the last moment, but doing that has taken much energy out of him. He still gets up and gets ready to face the mayor when suddenly, a cold wave spreads throughout the city. The mayor realizes that they plan to use the cryonic core against him, so he sends an explosive fireball to take care of his enemies at once and then runs to stop Zion from meddling with the core. Sheng uses barrier to keep everyone safe again, but Shiba and Saro have no energy left. 
Shang decides that he will go to save the best girl on the show by himself, and Saro gives him the spare magic power he has before teleporting him to Zion's location. Meanwhile, Zion feels the presence of a demon, so she hides behind a pillar and finds an armored demon heading towards the core. He draws out the core and resists its freezing powers thanks to the anti-cold armor he is wearing. Just then, the mayor arrives there and tells him to put the core where it belongs. The demon refuses, so he attacks him without holding back. The armored demon dodges his fireballs and rushes ahead to face him in a contest of strength. They are evenly matched, and the shockwaves from their clash start cracking up the hall. However, the armored demon was hiding his true strength. He suddenly transforms into a giant man bull and sends the mayor flying with a kick. He then charges towards him and pierces his heart with his claw. The mayor loses his life and the soul fragment within him comes out. The armored demon also returns to normal size and collects it in his item box along with the core. He is distracted for a while by the falling meteorite, and in that moment, Shang's divine staff hits his item box and shatters it. The core is flung away, but the soul fragment is absorbed by the staff. The armored demon is not happy about it, and he pulls away the divine staff from Shang before attacking him with an axe. Shang is not in a state to defend himself, but Xiang is quick to take action and protects him from the demon's attack. The divine staff is stuck to the demon's arm and constantly burns it, so he decides to cut off his arm to be free from it. He teleports away, declaring that you will get the core the next time. Just as the demon leaves, the giant meteorite approaches dangerously close to the city. Shang wonders what he should do now, and the mayor uses his last breath to tell him to break the core. Shang does just that and shatters the cryonic core with his staff, unleashing an intense cold wave that freezes the city. The energy from the broken core hits the meteorite and shatters it into harmless pieces. Shang collapses after using too much energy and falls on Xiang's lap, where he dreams happy dreams. Soon after that, they head towards a river that can heal even serious wounds, but Zen calls it a cap since they are traveling through a desert. Meanwhile, Sheng thanks Saro for saving his brother, but he seems to be lost in some solemn thoughts. They soon come to an abandoned desert town, where the Batmobile starts to malfunction and stops. Saro decides to go check out the engine, and Zen remarks that he seems to be down ever since they set out on this journey. Sheng also seconds his opinion, and Shiba tells him that this town once used to be a major mining center and Saro's army was stationed here. She believes that if they didn't need to take Zen to the Healing River, Saro would have never come here again. Zen, Zhang, and Sheng start gossiping and think that Saro must have suffered a pretty bad breakup here that still makes him sad, but Shiba lashes out at them. Despite her warning, Zen is sure that there is a woman Saro can't forget, so he rushes to give him free bro therapy. Zen goes to him and asks him if anything is burdening his mind, and Saro replies that they need a crystal that is found in the mines here to repair the engine. He wants to go alone and gets pissed at Zen when he tries to act too friendly. As Saro walks towards the mine, he finds a helmet that reminds him of the time when he led a special ops team to investigate demons in the mines. They found all the humans in the mine missing, and there was a giant hole in the ground with blood, helmets, and weapons spread around it. They realized that a battle took place here and found life signals coming from deep inside the mine. While everyone thought that they should retreat because they could run into demons inside the mine, Saro gave orders to investigate things. They ran into zombies in the mine and fought to repel them, but then the buff airbender dude in their group got bitten by a zombie. Saro ordered a strategic retreat to patch up the Baldi's wounds and ordered the tech support to contact the military. Little did they know that the blood from Baldi's wounds activated a trap and summoned a zombie-eating demon that lives in the darkest places in the demon realm. The demon attacked the room they were resting in and tech support got logged off from the face of the world. The demon killed all of Saro's teammates and he tried to stall it with a rock prison while healing one of his friends. However, there was no chance for him to survive and Saro could only cry that his hasty decision cost the lives of his friends. The injured man told him to survive and complete the mission, informing the world about what really was in the mine. Saro decided to fight back against the demon and attacked it with a sword and earth magic, but that was not enough to keep it down. He got knocked out, but then his injured friend walked towards the demon and used a self-destruct spell to seal it. Back to the present, Saro cuts off a piece of the crystal he requires when he notices something. He uses his magic to clear the dust around the area and finds the magic circle that can open the gates to the demon realm using the blood of the god clan. He realizes that this magic circle called the zombie-eating demon has killed all his friends. He is thirsting for revenge and activates the magic circle to summon the same demon again. Saro rushes to fight it, but slapped into unconsciousness. He sees his dead friends, but they tell him to find out who is behind the magic circle before joining them. Saro suddenly hears someone calling his name, and he opens his eyes to see Sheng there. Sheng informs him that they tracked him down when he took so long to return and found him passed out in front of the demon. 
Right now, Zen, Shiba, and Zayang are fighting the demon. But it is too sturdy and even Shiba's spirit cannon cannot damage it. It grabs Zen's head and tries to stab him, but Zayang ties its hand with her web, while Shiba climbs on it and hits its head. The demon is unfazed and overpowers all three of them, throwing them to the floor. Saro silently walks towards the demon, as he has decided to sacrifice himself to seal the monster, because he cannot lose any more of his friends. He uses his spiritual energy to create a huge explosion and asks Shang to protect everyone else using his barrier. Shang uses his barrier but keeps Saro inside it too, declaring that he will also not let his friends die. He uses the power of the Divine Staff and launches a powerful beam upward that creates a giant hole in the roof of the mine. The demon is severely allergic to light and turns to dust like he was an extra in the Infinity Wars. Later, Saro creates a memorial for his friends who lost their lives in the mine and promises to find the culprit behind the sacrificial magic circle. With that, he returns to the Batmobile, with Zen and Shang. They resume their journey and soon arrive at the magnificent and divine river that is said to heal everything. Saro tells the story about how long ago various races lived near this river and prayed as they took a dip in it. It was said to make any wish made with a pure heart true. And there was always a crowd here. Zayang asks where everyone is now, and Shiba explains that after the incident with the mine, the God Clan withdrew all their troops situated in this area. After that, demons took over this place, and humans couldn't dare to step foot here. Later, Zen and Shang take a dip in the river, and they find that it really heals all injuries quickly. Saro has told them that Zen needs to stay in the river all night to let his serious injuries fully heal. Suddenly, he senses something and turns around to see a man atop a cliff. Zen decides to see what he is up to and swims towards him. He greets the edgy goth swordsman, who doesn't care to reply. Zen comes out of the river and soon Shang brings his gear to him. As he gets dressed, he remarks that the goth swordsman might be strong because he is here all by himself. He asks him if he is here to fulfill his wish or heal his injuries and the edge alert finally decides to look towards him. He notices the twin swords with Zen and immediately recognizes them. He once fought against a silver-haired demon hunter wielding those two swords. The edge alert lost the battle, suffered a scar at his face for the first time in his life, and accepted the demon hunter named Qitian as his master. He tells Zen that these swords belong to his master, but he replies that he got them from his dad, and they don't know anyone by the name of Qitian. The edge alert doesn't believe Zen and says that Qitian was the strongest demon slayer in the world, and no weakling deserves to use his twin swords. He points his sword at Zen, deeming him unworthy of the swords. Zen draws out his swords, ready to prove his worth to him. The Edgler is raging to fight, but Shang tries to stop him, saying that they have no business with him. Just then, Shiba and Saro also arrive there and learn what just happened from Shen. Shiba tells the edgy swordsman that they don't want to do anything to him and asks him to just return home. He completely ignores her because she's a woman and Shiba gets furious at him. She goes closer to lash out at him, and he suddenly sends a flying slash that barely misses her and creates an explosion in the distance. Shiba is stunned speechless by that attack, and the edge alert tells Zen that he can either run like a sissy or fight him and prove his strength. However, Zayang steps up and asks him to stop. She has heard stories about the strongest swordsman in the demon clan, who uses a black sword with a glowing tip. She believes that the edge alert in front of them is the same swordsman named Bane. The edge alert says that she is right and tells her to get out of his way. Zayang tells him that she is not here to stop the fight, but it will be unfair right now because Zen is injured. Bane accepts her words and tells Zen that he has the entire night to heal himself. He stabs the earth with his sword, releasing a massive power wave as he declares that they will fight at dawn, and if Zen tries to run, he will kill all his friends. Everyone heaves a sigh of relief as he goes away, and they return to the Batmobile. Zayang tells what she knows about Bane. He was one of the generals of the demon army and was highly skilled and devoted to swordsmanship. To grow even stronger, he stole the treasured sword of the demon clan. When the demon king came to know this, he sent his elite soldiers to attack Bane, but he killed them all, including the demon king. Everyone thinks that they are doomed because no one can defeat Bane, but Zen says that the demon hunter Kitian beat him once. Saro tells him that he is not strong enough to do that, but Zen believes that the secret to defeating Bane must lie in the twin swords. He repeats what his dad said about the twin swords being the greatest treasure, passed down among the demon hunters and having unknown power hidden inside them. Zen declares that he has no intention to escape because they can't keep running away from stronger enemies. He thinks about his dad, who always emerged victorious, even against stronger demons, and decides to follow in his footsteps. Shang is worried about him, but Zen tells him that he will do anything he can to protect him. Shang runs away crying, saying that he doesn't need his protection. Later, Zen goes to take a dip in the river and Zayang decides to join him. 
Zen feels his third sword rising as she seductively approaches him and starts pouring water over his old wounds. She talks about how she understands Shang's feelings because her sister was the only family she had in the world too. She became a thief to give her a good life, but he failed to protect her in the end. Zion cries as she hugs Zen and asks him not to die because she doesn't want Shang to suffer the pain of losing his only family. Morning comes, and Zen's wounds are fully healed now. Sara casts a speed buff on him to help him in the battle. Shiba cheers him on in the traditional Tsundir style, while Zion has already woven a tank top for him out of her strong spider silk. Shang is still worried about him and Zen tells him that he might really die in this battle. But as a man, he will never back down from a fight. With that, he draws his swords and walks towards Bane. Zen recalls his past when he was a child and tried reaching out to the twin swords proudly displayed in his home. Daddy Yuan stopped him, saying that all demon hunters have their own special weapons and the twin swords can only be used by the chosen demon hunter. Zen wanted to become the chosen one, but his dad told him that it was not as grand as it sounded. The chosen one would have no purpose in life other than hunting demons, and there would be no joy in his life. Despite that, Zen wanted to be a hero and declared that he would become the chosen one. Yuan just laughed at him, saying that he was not ready. Zen thinks he is ready now and charges at Bane, attacking him with both his swords. Bane can easily block his attacks, but then Zen shows his real speed and suddenly reaches behind him for a surprise attack. Bane blocks that too and sends him away, but Zen returns to face him again. He gets slashed in his chest, but the armor Zion made protects him. However, Bane attacks him with a piercing attack that is able to damage his armor. Bane keeps on launching stabbing attacks at Zen, and while he dodges them, he recalls that his father used to train him using similar attacks too. He hit him with his staff, and when Zen complained about the difference in their weapon's reach, he just hit him in the head. In response, Zen just picked up the swords and ran away with his dad following him. Zen tied a string to his sword and used it to increase his reach, but Yuan easily kicked the sword away, telling him that such tricks would not be helpful in real battle. Zen stayed in the forest to train during the night too and got attacked by a bunch of bats. He tried hitting them with his swords, confident that the long reach was in his favor right now. However, the bats dodged his strikes and he learned that it is not the range that is important but the direction of the attack. He defeated the bats overnight and the next day he practiced with Yuan again. This time, he succeeded in pushing him back and dodged his long staff to point his sword at his neck. In the present, he uses the same principle to get closer to Bane and keeps on attacking him. Bane counterattacks and their swift clashes are too fast for the rest of the people to see. Zen finally sees a chance and deflects Bane's sword before gripping it and then striking him with his full power. Bane escaped his attack with just a small scratch, but now he has deems Zen a worthy opponent. He uses his real power and flicks him away using a force wave before covering his sword with his dark energy. Bane sends a dark slash towards Zen, and even though he manages to block it, his armor suffers damage. Bane keeps attacking Zen with dark slashes, breaking down his armor little by little. Zen is down on his knees and Bane attacks him from behind, but he still blocks his attack. The edge alert asks him if he still thinks that he can defeat him, and Zen replies that it seems impossible right now. However, that reminds him of another childhood memory. One winter day, as Zen was practicing in the woods, he found an injured man and learned that a monster had attacked his village. He took the injured man home and tried looking for his dad, but he was out to get milk at that time. So Zen decided to borrow the twin swords and rush to the village, where a monstrous bear was trying to eat a boy. He jumped at the bear with swords drawn, but got slapped to the sideline. He got up and taunted the bear with some snowballs, attracting its attention. That time, as he faced the bear, he knew that he was facing an overwhelmingly strong opponent. Zen feels the same thing right now as he faces Bane, but he cannot back away because he wants to protect his friends. Bane sends a dark slash at him, and Zen manages to cut it, but with the next slash, Bane brings him down. In the past two, Zen got his ass whooped by the bear, but then suddenly his blood trickled down the swords and a dark flame covered them. The bear realized he was screwed, but just as Zen leaped to attack him, Yuan arrived and knocked him out. He forced the bear to retreat too, and then took his son home. Zen apologized and asked him why he lost control when the power of the sword awakened and Yuan explained that the twin swords are made from demonic steel and they activate their true power using the blood of their master. Yuan told Zen that the demonic power comes at a great cost, and if he cannot control it, he will be consumed by it. Back to the present, Zen decides to use the forbidden power of the twin swords and cuts his arms to make his blood trickle down. As soon as the swords are drenched in blood, Zen's whole body is covered in the dark flames and he goes berserk. The special effects die down in a few seconds, and he attacks Bane and sends him flying with a single strike. 
Zen hits the edgy demon to the ground and he overwhelms him with his great speed. Bane claims that he is not strong enough to defeat him yet. He shows his full power and cuts a huge rock in half before telling Zen that he still cannot be compared to Tuitian yet. Zen attacks him again, but Bane blocks him and then blasts him into the river. Zen rises out of the river, oozing murderous intent, and that is just what the demon wants. Zen has lost all sense of reason and he attacks Bane recklessly, who just smiles at being pushed back. However, Zen gets worse with each passing moment and suddenly starts walking towards his friends. Shiba tells him to finish Bane first, but he suddenly attacks them. Shang somehow blocks his first attack, but with a second slash, Zen sends everyone away. He can only see them as four dark shadows and attacks Zayang next. She dodges his attacks and then Suro attacks him with a powerful magic spell. He tries to freeze Zen, but that is not enough to tie him down, and Shang finds it out the hard way when he goes to check up on his brother. Zen declares that he will kill all the demons and roars as he unfreezes himself. He tries to attack Zayang and Shang again, but then suddenly, a gust of dust blocks his way and Bane stabs his shoulder. Zen loses his consciousness as a result and finds himself in a strange dream. The twin swords are revolving in front of him, and he strains to grab them. Suddenly, he sees a memory of Kai Tian, the previous owner of these swords, and by his side is Yuan. Zen sees them traveling through a town badly affected by famine and demons, with everyone on the verge of death. They try to help and comfort the people, and suddenly, a tribe of mountain demons arrives there. Kai Tian kills them all and then climbs to the headquarters of the demons. He finds some kids there, who start crying as soon as they see him. An elder demon begs Ki Tian to at least spare the kids, and Ki Tian decides not to follow in Darth Vader's footsteps. He meets Yumon outside the cave and tells him that no matter how many demons they kill, they won't be able to bring true peace. That is why he leaves on a journey and arrives in the demon realm, where he finds the scene of the carnage left behind by Bane. He soon found Bane, who could tell that Ki Tian was more powerful than anyone he had ever met. Bane challenged him to a fight, and he obliged. Years later, an old and frail Ki Tian made his way to Yuan and the rest of the demon slayers with a baby. He gave the baby, who turned out to be Shang, to Yuan and asked him to take good care of him. Ki Tian declared that he did not have long to live, and he named Shang as his sole hope to achieve true peace. As soon as this dream is over, Zen opens his eyes while lying in the river, with Bane's sword still stuck in his shoulder. Bane pulls out the sword and starts walking away, and Zen asks him why he is letting him live. The edgelord replies that Ki Tian spared his life back then, and he is just returning the favor. He tells Zen to become a demon hunter worthy of the twin swords and challenge him to a death battle then. After that, Shang comes running to his brother and hugs him while crying. Zen wants to tell him about the dream he just had, but before that, he wants to eat something. Later, Zen tells Shang about Ki Tian and Yuan and says that they must continue their journey to find more clues about the twin swords and the divine staff. They return to the Batmobile, and Zen asks if there is a place that can tell them about these things. Shiba says that there is a place, but she will not tell lowly humans about it, and Zen starts quarreling with her. Just then, Saro arrives there, and he decides to spill the beans about Fenkun City, which is the only city of gods in the human realm. He agrees to take everyone there, much to Shiba's disappointment. They set out for Fenkun City, and Shiba is still grumpy because she doesn't want to go there for personal reasons. Saro asks her why she is so worried, and she tries to convince him that the trip will be in vain and they won't find anything there. He doesn't believe that because Chong, the governor of the Fenkun city, is the wisest man in the mortal realm. Suddenly, Shang comes running to them because the divine staff is pointing towards something nearby. Saro finds that it is pointing towards Fenkun city itself and everyone but Shiba is excited to reach there quickly. After a long journey, they finally arrive in Fenkun, which is more glamorous than they could imagine. The security drones register them, and the guards permit them to enter the city. Suddenly, they hear a declaration that the new governor of Fenkun City will get married in three days, and Shiba is stunned to hear that. She angrily marches to see the new governor named Ron because he is an old friend of hers. On the way, Shang spots a giant peach, and the old shopkeeper tells him that all fruits are free right now to celebrate Governor Rong's marriage. Shiba reacts quite violently to this, and asks the old lady more about the wedding and the bride. Everyone is confused by her behavior when suddenly a group of guards arrive there to receive them. They ask Zen and the gang to follow them to the main palace because they are their esteemed guests, and they can't believe it. They enter the palace and enjoy a hearty meal while waiting for Governor Rong, who makes his entrance soon. He tells his guests to skip the formalities and enjoy the meal. Zen and Shang go back to having the food while Saro greets Rong and tells him that they are here to gain some information. Rong is happy to help, but he knows that only his dad Chong can answer Saro's question. He's out of town and will return only on the day of the wedding. 
Zion congratulates him on the wedding and apologizes for not bringing a gift and Rong replies that they have brought his bride along with them, which is the greatest gift. Everyone is shocked as they see Rong looking romantically at Shiba at Wakemiya's gaze. Rong and Shiba were childhood friends and she always protected him from the four Donkey Kong brothers who bullied him. He fell in love with her and asked her to be his future wife. Shiba was a knave kid back then and didn't know what that was, so she promised to marry him for free ice cream. Rong had been waiting for her all his life and he programmed the security drones to recognize her. The moment she arrived in the city, he declared the wedding ceremony to be started. He is really happy that he can finally get married and laid, but Shiba tells him to hold his horses. She claims that she didn't even know about marriage when she made the promise. On top of that, she was the one who asked the bullies to pester Rong every day so she could save him from them, and then he would buy her all the snacks she wanted. Rong doesn't care that Shiba was always a gold digger because he loves her. He holds her hands, saying that he will give her all the money she wants and Zen laughs, saying that Shiba is really lucky. She is furious at him and even Shang tries to hold back his brother. Zen simply tells him that they need to meet Rong's dad, and he won't come to the city unless the wedding is held. Zai and Saro understand this already, and they try to convince Shiba to join the plan. She agrees to act like a bride but has no intention to really marry Rong. He takes her to her room while the rest of the crew says that they want to explore Feng Kung City. Shang and Saro decide to search for the soul fragment, while Zen and Zayang decide to collect information in the market. Zen and Zayang take a drink break because they couldn't find anything in the city. Zen spots an attractive girl and Zayang doesn't seem to be happy about it. Suddenly, she notices that the girl is being targeted by a low-class thief, and sure enough, a thief steals her necklace. As the girl calls the guards to help her, Zen rushes to confront the thief himself. He is busy monologuing, so the thief just shoves him away before running. The girl brings the guards to Zen, and he thinks that she is trying to thank him, but then notices that the stolen necklace is around his neck. Zen is arrested for stealing and tries telling the guards that he didn't know how the necklace ended up around his neck. The guards don't believe him so he tells them that he is a guest of Governor Rong, and Zayang tells them to look at their entry documents. The guards check out their documents, but instead of being royal guests, they are labeled as illegal immigrants. Zen and Zayang have no choice but to run away as the guards chase them. On the other hand, Shang and Saro also fail to find any clue about the soul fragment. The signal turns on and off frequently, and Saro wonders if there is even a soul fragment in the city. The divine staff also acts weird, spinning aimlessly sometimes and then pointing in random directions. It eventually points towards the city gate and Shang and Saro go outside the city following the signal. However, as soon as they reach the forest, the signal disappears. They decide to return to Fengkun City, but the gates close right in front of their eyes. Shang tries to knock on the gates but gets repelled by the barrier protecting the city. Saro also tries to knock, but the result is the same, and they find a strange old man locked outside the city along with them. The man claims that his daughter was ill, and he went out to collect medicinal herbs for her. Shang wants to help him, so he calls out to the guards and tells them about the old man's daughter. The guards refuse to open the gate for him because Rong has directly given them the order to lock down the city. Sarva calms him down because he thinks there is no way the gate will open for them now. While Shang tries to find another way to enter the city, Sarva talks to the creepy old man and learns that the city has never been locked like this before. Shang tries to use a grapple hook to climb over the wall, but the barrier deflects it, and when Sarva tries to use his spiritual magic to walk on air, the barrier stops him too. The old man says that there is another way to enter the city. He says that he used to play outside the city when he was young and found this secret tunnel that led inside. The old man guides them to the tunnel's entrance, and it opens just as Shang touches it. They climb down the tunnel and find a way blocked by a barrier. Shang gets repelled as he tries to force his way, but he thinks that Saro can cross the barrier since he belongs to the God Clan. Saro decides to try this theory out and finds that he can really cross the barrier. He sees the magic letters on the walls and tries to find out a way to switch off the barrier. His finger gets cut by a protruding nail, and his blood disables the barrier. The old man enters the tunnel, and Shang follows after making sure that he won't be bounced back again. They soon find the exit of the tunnel, and Saro asks the old man to climb up before them. However, once he opens the door at the end, he decides to let the young ones go ahead. The door actually opens at the dance floor on a bar, and Shang and Saro pop up out of it right under the dancer's dress. Saro quickly uses his magic and makes Shang do cartwheels in the air so that they can pretend to be performers as well. The crowd doesn't mind them, but the dancer reports them to the guards, who chase after them for entering the city illegally. They run away and hide from the guards, but find that their faces are on display on Feng Kun's version of Times Square. They are declared to be the most wanted illegal immigrants in the city, and the people are ready to rat them out instantly. 
They can only run away, and Sheng asks why the old man was not caught by the camera. Saro realizes that they walked into a trap, and the old man was definitely hiding something. On the other hand, Shiba has been dressed up in her bridal outfit, and she keeps telling herself that she is doing this just to buy time for her team. The butler arrives after she is ready and takes her to Ron, who is already waiting for her for a pre-wedding shoot. They click on various pictures, but Shiba doesn't smile in a single one of them. Ron tries to kiss her, so she steps on his foot and gets away from him. She asks him why he is trying to marry her when she already told him that she lied to him. Ron moves closer to her and whispers if she knows why the four Donkey Kong brothers started bullying him. He says that Shiba was always at the center of their class, while he was a god from the mortal realm, so he had no chance to get close to her. That is why he bribed the Donkey Kong brothers with fried chicken to learn more about her. They reveal that Shiba loves to eat, but has no money, and she also hates injustice. That gave Rong an idea, and he asked the brothers to bully him in exchange for food, and they carried out their mission successfully. They created a ruckus that attracted everyone's attention, and Shiba saved Rong just as he planned. Shiba is shocked to hear that she was fooled by 200 IQ play and curses him. Rong tells her that Fenkin City is the most stable place in the mortal realm, that is why he could not leave it, and he had no choice but to wait for her. Shiba clearly tells him that she didn't come here for him but to obtain the soul fragment and free the gods. Rong sheds a single tear and says that he deserves being lied to because he started it all. Shiba apologizes to him and he turns around to hug her, catching her off guard for a moment. He holds her hand after that, and the photographer clicks a perfectly timed photo that is instantly displayed all over the city. Everyone gives their blessings to the couple, but Saro and Sheng think something is fishy. Saro realizes that Rong deliberately messed up the signal of the soul fragment to lead them out of the city so that he could force Shiba to marry her. On the other hand, Zen and Zayang also see the pre-wedding pictures, and they also realize that they were set up. Back at the palace, Shiba is demanding the cameraman delete the picture immediately, but as she turns towards Rong, she suddenly loses the gleam in her eyes and becomes completely obedient to him. It turns out that he used a soul fragment to hypnotize her, because that is his version of spiking a girl's drink. Ron apologizes to the hypnotized Shiba, saying that he doesn't want her to be in danger anymore. Meanwhile, Zen and Zayang have changed their attire to remain hidden from the guards and try to find a way into the wedding of Shiba and Rong. Zayang approaches some rich and important guys she located using her gold digger radar and instantly rizzes them up to get closer to them. While both the men are busy fighting for her attention, she skillfully latches her spiderweb to their wedding invitation cards and attaches it to a rope in Zen's hand. The two simps try to invite Zayang to be their plus one to attend the grand wedding, but by the time they realize their invitation cards are gone, Zayang and Zen are also on their way. Zen asks her if it is alright for her to steal again, and she simply replies that he was the one who did the stealing. She then asks him how he will smuggle his swords into the wedding and Zen replies that he has it all figured out. He will pretend to be a weapon merchant and say that these swords are a gift for Rong. Zayang likes the idea and she decides to pretend to be the merchant's trophy wife. On the other hand, Shang and Sarov have been arrested and thrown into prison. Shang tells the guards that they are the friends of the governor's fiends and want to see the wedding too. Sarov does one better and says that he is Sheba's personal nurse and she needs him by her side in case she suffers any seizures. One of the guards finds the security footage and confirms that they are indeed friends of Sheba and he decides to inform Rong about it. Rong is busy flirting with the hypnotized Sheba when the guard tells him about them. Rong tells the butler to take his bride back to his room while he deals with the prisoners. He arrives at the prison to see them and asks them why they returned when he graciously gave them a chance to leave. Sheng gets up to confront him and asks him what he did to Shiba, and Rong replies that she chose to be his bride. He takes out his soul fragment, but Sheng is quick to take action and breaks his cuffs using the divine staff. He attacks Rong, who dodges him easily, and then knocks him down with a single kick. Saro attacks Rong from behind, but he dodges it too and hits him with a punch powered by the soul fragment, instantly putting him under his spell. Rong ties Shang with spiritual bandages and promises that he won't kill him, however, he will take control of his soul. Rong tries to absorb Shang's consciousness, but that triggers the soul fragments of the god of war inside him. Shang grabs Rong's hand and starts absorbing his power instead, forcing him to abort the mission. The rich boy is now afraid of Shang, who is still recovering from the attack earlier. However, Saro steps up to defend his master and Rong quickly leaves the prison before Sheng wakes up. Saro attacks Sheng without warning and throws him to the ground. Sheng asks him to recognize him, but Saro has lost all his control, so he attacks him again. Sheng dodges it and picks up the divine staff, right as Saro breaks free of the cuffs and attacks him with fire magic. Sheng dodges his attacks and knocks him out, but then he wonders what he should do next. 
He feels helpless without his friends and brother guiding him and gives up all hope to save everyone. As he is whining about his weakness, he suddenly finds himself within his consciousness and sees a pair of flaming eyes. He hears the voice of the god of war, telling Sheng that he should let him take over his body to save everyone. Sheng thinks that this is another test and the voice and eyes are there just to tempt him. He summons the divine staff and attacks the eyes, which vanish along with the ground he was standing on. Sheng falls, but as soon as he grabs the divine staff, it starts glowing and he finds himself back in the prison. He pulls himself together and starts crying for help, saying that his friend is having a stroke. A guard unlocks the door to check up on Sorrow, but Sheng knocks him out cold and runs to the exit. However, he keeps running in circles because the prison is a freaking maze. Suddenly, he hears someone offering to help him if he can free him. Sheng finds a man imprisoned in a special cell who introduces himself as Governor Chong, the master of Fengkun City. Chong claims that his son Rong imprisoned him here so that he could get the post of governor and even lied to everyone that he was meditating in seclusion. Sheng decides to trust the man and uses the divine staff as a lockpick to open the doors to his prison cell. He then tries to uncuff him, telling him that he and his friends are here to meet him and learn more about the divine staff. Sheng tells Chong that his son has taken his friends hostage and asks for his help in stopping him. Chong helps him sneak out of the prison and into the palace. He even tells Sheng the location of the wedding hall. But the boy fumbles and gets caught. The guards surround him and Chong, but then suddenly, a thick smoke covers the area and Zen and Zhang arrive there to take the guards down. Sheng is glad to see his brother and Zhang. He introduces them to Chong and explains the evil plan Rong is hatching. Sheng also tells them that Sorrow attacked him after being hypnotized by Rong and Chong claims that it is the power of the soul fragment he has. Zhang realizes that this must be how Rong managed to convince Shiba to marry. While Sheng is busy cursing him, Zen suddenly draws out his twin swords and points them at Chong, asking if he knows about these swords. The old man knows that they are forged from demonic steel and were once used by the greatest demon hunter called Qi Tian, but they are different from their original state right now. Zen apologizes for his sudden action and thanks Chong. He says that learning about the swords can wait because first they must save their friends. For that, they need some good clothes to sneak into the wedding and Zen rushes to arrange them. He kidnaps two guys who are conveniently the same size as Sheng and Chong. He steals their clothes and invitation. And once Sheng and Chong are dressed up, they leave to save Shiba and Saro. They enter the party hall and keep an eye on the guests while Zion tries to collect information. The butler welcomes all the guests to the wedding. And while he rambles on and on about the occasion, Zen and Zion come up with a plan. They will save Shiba and get out of the wedding hall first. As Zen will stall wrong while others will go and rescue Saro from jail. Sheng suddenly points out that Saro is on the balcony, acting as a witness to this marriage. Zhang says that it is better that both their friends are here, and then asks Chong if the soldiers will listen to him if he steps up now. He replies that Rong already has the guards under his control, so he cannot overrule his authority. Instead, he suggests to Zen fight against Rong with honor, and as per the tradition of Fengkun City, Rong would have to accept a one-on-one -on -one fight with him. Zen immediately agrees to the idea, and Chong says that once everyone is in chaos, he will reveal his identity to save Shiba and Saro. Soon after that, Rong and Shiba arrive there. The butler acts as the priest and conducts the ceremony. Both Rong and the hypnotized Shiba agree to the marriage, but send objects to it. He steps forward, telling Rong that he wishes to fight him. The crowd is curious about the strange man, and some people who just live for the drama declare that a warrior is challenging the governor to win over his bride. Zen tries to convince them that this is just a duel for honor, but the guests have already placed the stakes in the battle. The butler quickly declares that according to their custom, the groom and the challenger will fight each other for the bride's hand. Both Zen and Rong go outside with the butler taking the job of the commentator too, like a true hustler. The crowd cheers for Rong, claiming that no human can dare win against a member of the god clan. Zen leaps at Rong, who blocks his swords with his spear and the energy released from their clash shakes the arena. Taking advantage of this confusion, Zhang sneaks to Saro and tries to wake him up. When shaking him doesn't work, she slaps him repeatedly. But then Rong notices her. He uses his power to command Saro to attack her, and he pins her to the ground. Zhang calls him a molester and kicks him away. Back in the arena, Rong is distracted by Saro and Zhang giving Zen a chance to give him a cut to the face. He wonders how a human can be so strong and decides to use his full power against him. He spins his spear imbues it with ice magic, and suddenly attacks Zen with twice the speed. Zen can only try to dodge his attacks, but he still gets hit. On the other hand, Sheng and Chong reach Shiba, who is unresponsive because of Rong's control. Sheng looks at the arena and finds that his brother's wound is freezing. 
Chong says that Rong has a special ice element spear that can even freeze blood if his full power is used. Sheng is worried about his brother and asks Chong to declare the truth to everyone now. He replies that the time is not right yet and asks Sheng to believe in Zen. In the arena, Rong taunts Zen that his two pitiful swords are no match for his spear, and he replies that he has fought much stronger opponents than him in the past. He rushes at Rong who dodges and counterattacks, while saying that staying in Fengkun City is the best thing for Shiba. He yells that freeing the gods from the dimensional prison is not possible, and then kicks in away while freezing his legs too. Rong says that humans cannot defeat a god, but Sen tells him not to underestimate humans. He gets up and unleashes his energy to break the ice, and then immediately attacks Rong. Just as the big dust cloud is settled, Rong rushes towards Zen, who easily dodges his attack with some fancy acrobatics, and then successfully lands a hit on him. Both of them unleash their full power and rush towards each other again. They keep exchanging blows, and shockwaves from their clashes are strong enough to destroy the arena. Both of them jump high into the sky, while spinning and attack each other with their full strength, creating a huge explosion. The audience is blown away, and they eagerly wait for the black smoke to disperse to see who won. This was the chance Sheng was waiting for, and he yells at the top of his voice that Rong is a fraud. He reveals that he not only hypnotized his bride-to-be, he had also locked away his dad in prison to take over his position. Chong steps up to deliver his speech next, and Rong is stunned to see him free. The crowd wants to know the truth, and Chong repeats just what Sheng said before commanding his soldiers to arrest Rong. As Ron is surrounded by the guards, he shouts that his dad is under the control of a demon, but no one listens to him. So he decides to abandon everything, and uses the full power of his spear to unleash a powerful cold wave that blows the guards away and freezes them. The cold wave is so powerful that the entire arena is frozen and its effect reaches even Shiba. As Ron tries to go towards her, he notices that Zen is still standing despite being half-frozen. He frees himself from the ice and lunges right, delivering a clean slash to his thigh. Rong retaliates and stabs his back, but Zen has gone berserk, and he doesn't care about the damage. He rushes at Rong, who blocks his attack and tells him to believe him just this once because Chong is lying to them. Zen refuses to believe him, but then he hears the sound of the old governor groaning. He breaks free of the ice trapping him, and then suddenly falls unconscious. A dark energy is released from his body, and it transforms into the white-haired demon Sumer that killed Zen's dad. She laughed as she trampled on Chong's body, saying that he was a fool to think that he could control her within his weak body. So basically, Chong and the white-haired woman's deal was like Naruto sealing the nine tails inside his body, and recently, she had been trying to break free. Chong felt the symptoms, and he ordered his son to lock him up in the most secure prison he has so that the demon could never come out. Rong accepted his order with a heavy heart and sealed his dad in prison, but it was all for nothing. Now Rong is determined to stop Sumire, but his determination is nothing compared to Zen's rage against his father's murderer. He leaps towards the woman to attack her, but she is ready for him. She suddenly pulls Shang using her strings and places him in front of Zen as a meat shield. He abruptly stops his attack, and then Sumar controls Shang to unleash the divine staff and hit Zen for a home run. He somehow dodges the attack and tells the demon to let his brother go. Suddenly, Ron charges towards her, but Sumer dodges his attack before telling him that his opponent is not here, but in the arena. She takes a bell out and rings it, and the old man who led Shang and Sorrow into the city suddenly appears in the arena. Sumir rings the bell to unleash his full powers, and the old man turns into the giant blindfolded demon that Zen's dad fought. The red demon leaps towards them and sends Zen and Rong flying with a single strike. They have no choice but to fight the red demon together now. They dodge the demon's first attack, and then Rong hits him with a drop kick. He hits the demon with his spear, but it is not effective, and the demon throws him away, just before Zen attacks him. He also gets tossed away and tells Rong that their weapons are useless against it. Rong decides to use the soul fragment he has and embeds it into his spear, greatly increasing its power. He hits the ground with his spear and freezes the red demon's legs, giving Zen the chance to slash his shoulders. The demon groans in pain and shatters the ice, sending a few shards towards Shiba that Rong quickly neutralizes. The demon runs towards them again, but stops right before attacking them. He suddenly leaps towards Shiba, who is now back on her senses, and just as the demon can attack her, Rong arrives there to save her. He pierces the demon's chest with his ice spear, but in doing so, he also suffers a fatal injury from the demon's claw. Zen arrives there to finish the weakened demon and sends it spinning with some powerful slashes. He turns around to see Rong on his knees with Shiba by his side. She asks him why he did this, and he replies that all he ever wanted was to keep her safe. Shiba cries, and Rong says that even though they cannot marry now, he still wants to protect her. He gives her the soul fragment within him and dies immediately. 
Shiba is too stunned to react and doesn't grab the soul fragment even as Zen tells her to. Meanwhile, Sumar has noticed it too, and she controls Shang to absorb the soul fragment into the divine staff. Zen rushes to attack her, but she uses Shang to block his attack again. Suddenly, they hear Shiba screaming and turn around to see her charging her spirit cannon. She fires at Sumar, not caring that Shang and Zen will get caught in the crossfire. Zen dodges the attack and tells her to stop, and she collapses. He turns around to find that Shang used his barrier to protect Sumir. He asks her what she did to his brother, and she replies that he is her boy toy now. Zen declares that he will kill Sumir, but she tells him that he is all alone. He says that it is better that way because his friends won't get caught in the crossfire. He slashes his arms and soaks his swords with blood, unleashing the demonic power within his twin blades. Even Sumir is taken aback by that, and she controls the red demon like a puppet to attack Zen from behind and sends him back to the arena. The demon jumps to attack him, but Zen dodges him and quickly gets on his shoulder, stabbing it mercilessly with his sword. The demon tosses him away, and as soon as Zen gets back on his feet, he tries to maintain his consciousness while keeping the power. Sumir realizes this too, so she decides to crush his soul. She attacks his heart, and Zen suddenly finds himself reliving the memories of his dad's death. He falls to his knees in despair, but then he hears Yuan's voice, telling him that one day he will understand the true meaning of the twin swords and become the greatest demon hunter. As Zen hears this, his mind is free from Sumari's control, and she can only see him glowing with a divine radiance. Meanwhile, Zen finds himself high above the clouds and the swords disappear from his hand. Suddenly, Qiqian appears in front of him, holding the two swords. He changes the swords to their original form with the blue and red jewels in them. Zen requests that she teach him how to use the swords properly. Katina tells him that the swords are not important, and instead, the desire to protect what he loves is what truly matters. He then shows Zen his ultimate move, swinging the swords to create a yin-yang symbol mid-air. Back in the arena, Zen gains control of himself and uses the same special move, ending the Red Demon's life in one hit. He then immediately moves behind Sumair, telling her to let his brother go where she will die. She pulls a fast one on him and uses Shang to attack him from behind. Zen is sent flying into a nearby building and Sumer sends Shang to attack him again. She controls him and the Divine Staff to keep attacking Zen with icicles popping out from the ground. He can only dodge them but not for long. Shang screams at Sumire to let him be free, but he can't stop hitting Zen and ultimately smashes him to the ground. Sunir tries to make Shang finish Zen, but he quickly disbalances his brother and puts him in a chokehold. Shang begs Zen to kill him and then fight against the demon, but he is not willing to do so. Sumir decides to send the brothers to the afterlife together and uses the same five-finger prison technique that their dad used. As the fingers grow closer to them, Zen decides to make the sacrifice play and throws Shang high in the air, taking full damage from Sumire's technique. Shang cries and suddenly reaches deep into his consciousness. He asks the god of war to lend him his power. The god asks him to sacrifice his soul as a price, and he accepts it. Shang breaks the strings with which Sumire was controlling him and suddenly goes Super Saiyan. She pisses her pants as she realizes that the boy has awakened the power of the god of war, and that is the last thing she does as the elongated divine staff pierces her body. He hoists her up and Sumer screams as she bursts into flames. Shang lets out a roar after that and then quietly collapses. Soon, Governor Chong wakes up to see the frozen palace and signs of battle before looking at his dead son and would-be daughter-in-law. Soon after that, a grand funeral is held for Rong, with everyone present there except Zen, who watches everything from a distance. He survived despite facing severe injuries, but he is still cursing himself that he couldn't avenge his dad. A few days later, the party of heroes set out on their journey again, but the Divine Staff no longer points towards any soul fragment. Chong tells them that all the soul fragments in this region have been collected, and now they should go to the Mountain of Gods in the West. He opens a portal for them and bids Shiba a special goodbye, telling her that she is always welcome in Fengkun City. With that, they get on their Batmobile and drive into the portal to start the second phase of their journey. If you like this video, you would love this loser who reincarnates to become the strongest hero.